details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. So I'm the small stuff. That's right. Um, how you been, James? I've been pretty good. You got some news, and I'm excited I've, to hear this I've got news. lots of news. Yes. Uh, maybe we should start from the small news. I got these sweet new kicks. You got some shoes. Yes. So, oh, James reached down to oh. get his shoes. Oh, he pulled his shoe off. Yeah. So wow. every once in a while, I get onto the Nike and Adidas websites, and mostly Adidas just lets me down with where their sizing goes up to. Right. Uh, so I always, yeah, once I put in that size 15 filter, the <laughs> options go down to like one row. Oh, man. Uh, but I saw these, and I was just take like they were just so striking i was so taken with them that i bought them pretty much immediately what are they called so these are the let's see they are the nike harachi edge and the edge is spelt out in all caps with periods in between each letter um and they're Here, can I, look at it? I forget the name of their designer is it preston here on Preston, I believe Here is what Preston, we were talking about yeah. earlier. But yeah, these are really kind of cool. I like them because, you know, they do have a little bit of that dad shoe vibe. You got a lot of these swoopy lines in here, kind yeah. of some more arbitrary uh, shapes. Well, I won't call them arbitrary, but, uh, you know, you have these more organic shapes. And then you have these primary blocks of, what, the midsole? Yeah. I'm, well, I'm learning my I'm learning my shoe techniques because I've been watching a few of the Seth Fowler's videos. Oh yeah, you know, and you got, uh, yeah, you got these like <laughs> red, blue, yellow, and green midsole features that are really kind of striking. It well, the whole thing you have is white here. And here's the other cool thing is that the right shoe and the left shoe are different in terms of colors. The colors. So oh. on the outside of the right shoe is what? The blue and the red or right. blue and green. So same form, but and they switched up the, the block colors. Yes. The outside of the left the shoe, you've colors. got this red and yellow block. And then on the inside of the right, you got the yellow. Inside of the left, you got green. And then even the insoles are different colors. Yeah, that's cool. So just all sorts of great minor details in there. I do like that kind of playful aesthetic, but done in a nice elegant way yeah i would say it's like the colors give it that playfulness right or like primary playfulness i I don't know i feel like it's not as dad shoe i feel like it's more i don't know it's like almost like postmodern shoe yeah it's it's something it's it's more athletic than than the normal dad shoe and definitely has more of that modern like silhouette that we're used to um but yeah heron preston johnson i didn't know a lot about him He's kind of like a Virgil Abloh type. Yeah. So he was a co-founder of the men's streetwear brand Bean Trail alongside Virgil Abloh, Matthew William, and Justin Saunders. The fashion world. The fashion world. It, it has invaded our lives, and uh, I'm, I'm glad for it. I think fashion right now is super interesting. Like what's, what's popular and what's... I am a little bit fashion illiterate. Oh, I'm totally fashion illiterate, <laughs> but I'm fascinated by We're slowly by getting it. there. I mean, with the shoe stuff, I feel like every week I'm I learn so, something new about shoes. I'm so fascinated by fashion that you could almost say I'm fascinated oh, no. by it. We got we to gotta, we gotta turn <laughs> off the podcast <laughs> off. We got we to gotta restart. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but anyway, so that's one piece of news. Okay. Um, but I guess... And then there's this other piece of news that uh, I was... Yesterday, I went and hung out with scott henderson okay um he's an industrial designer here in new york right he is and like this guy we connected on instagram and he was like hey you know come by my studio and this guy is like he's an id master yeah it looks like he's had tons of products that he's worked on yeah i I, I don't know his full career but i i would love to get him in here on the podcast sometime i mean he was at if I remember correctly, he was at Smart Design for 14 years, starting 14 year, s- or like 12 years, starting in the early 90s. Wow. Okay. And so he was working there when like OXO had kind of just begun. Right. When they did the when, when yeah. they were like l- literally a startup. Right. With the peeler. Yeah. And uh, but Scott has has designed a lot of Ooh, wait, super iconic products. I'm looking at this like pyramid shape. Oh yeah. Here. This is. Uh, a frame, a photo frame for Nambe. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, he has a really, 
What I love about Scott's work is he has this really playful but sophisticated aesthetic. It it has a uh, an Alessi feel to it. Yeah, to me. So this uh, this thing. I, I put a little micro details on the Instagram I did. page. I like that. It was a little, uh, that. little like journalism, like S- out in the field. Scott was like, you want me to like, you know, explain one of my things? You want to take a video? And I was like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. If you guys aren't following the minor details podcast, Instagram at minor details pod, check that out. <laughs> Maybe we'll do some more of these micro details. Yeah. So he, he explains, I mean, this is, so this is for skip hop, this, uh, this it's a faucet cover okay so like for kids when right when you're in taking the bath yeah so that they don't like fall and hit their head on that stainless steel faucet look if it's meant to be there's a little minor details logo oh my god i'm just kidding that's a skip hop logo um but it's uh it's in the shape of a whale and it's just like the cutest thing but it's also like not gaudy and yeah it's, it's a very like minimal whale yeah, and this is apparently just like still a, a top seller. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, Scott, thanks again for having me over. That was that was a lot of fun. Does he listen to the podcast? I guess he's. I will. You'll send him this podcast. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, uh, I was telling him about our podcast. I think he he's gonna he's gonna check it out. Cool. cool. Um, but uh, yeah, and then so the other piece of news, and this I, is the big news. This is the big news. My wife and I adopted a new cat. Congrats! Thank James. you very much. So we we had a a cat that we unfortunately passed away about a year ago, um, and uh, rest in peace, Jimmy Davis. And so we went to this adoption event this past weekend that was put on by it was like a bunch of adopt uh, like adoption agencies or or like I, I don't know what you call them. What's the foster what's the word? families? Uh, foster I mean they like. They're they're like no kill shelters, okay. Like a bunch of no kill shelters, right. and and so the one that we ended up adopting from, I think it's called Best Friends Animal Society. Um, and so yeah, we walked we walked in there. They got a great logo, by yeah, the it's way. A good logo. <laughs> uh, we walked in there and we were looking around, and there were a lot of kittens there, and we weren't we weren't necessarily looking for a kitten. Wait, were you looking for a dog? No, no, we were looking for a cat. Oh, okay. A yeah. grown cat. Yes. Okay. So we, we weren't lo- looking for a kitten necessarily. Why, why don't you want a kitten? Because it's a lot of, that's a lot more work, you know? I feel like kittens are the cutest thing ever. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, they're cute, but I can just imagine how, how much of a handful they are to begin with. I guess that's true. And with two working parents... It's uh, it's a little difficult, but so we were walking around and we saw some adult cats and this one cat that was sitting at the f- front of his cage, uh, but he was asleep. But the person next to the cage was like, you know, he was he was like very social earlier. I think he's just like worn out. Right. And so we kind of made a round and we came back and he woke up and we got to meet him and yeah. <laughs> shook his shook his paw and uh, just uh, just a. a a delightful gentleman. Okay. Um, so they had, they had named him Snow, uh, but is he uh, white? Let me actually. I can pull up my wife's Instagram. Um, Allison, or or can I? There we go. So, um, so yeah, this is this is oh, him. This is the cutest cat. So ever. he's a domestic short hair. So, but he's got a lot of white on him. Okay. Um. But and there he is dabbing, uh, but uh, but the thing the thing that we think the reason that he's he was named Snow is because he has this scar on his stomach. Okay. And for any Game of Thrones fans out there, Jon Snow was stabbed in the stomach, came back to life. I see. I see. Um, and so we were guessing that that's why they called him that. But he he was from he's from Philadelphia. He was a stray in Philadelphia. So I was like, as a Philly boy, I was like, oh man. This cat has already got it for me, and so I, uh, so we ended up naming him Benjamin Franklin Snow. Benjamin Franklin being from Philadelphia, Franklin uh, being a street in Brooklyn, uh, and then um, also the person that told us about the adoption event, uh, her name is Benny. Okay. And so we call him Benny. Benny. Yeah. Yeah, Benny. Yeah. I've so, heard that I've heard that actually cats respond to na- actually all 
dogs and cats both respond to better with names that have a e sound at the end. Mm, interesting. Well, it it seems to work. I mean, like he will literally come when you call him. Right. We we think so. He's four years old. We think that he was like, you know, they, what they know about him is that as far as they know is that he was a stray. He has a tattoo too, right? Oh yeah, he has a tattoo. Is I it think, a real tattoo? I think it's what, what is that? What is it? What does it mean? <laughs> you said you said he had a tattoo, and I'm like thinking like. Oh, like a, a tattoo that the vet gave him? I or like a tattoo that some person gave him? Like... I forget if it's to denote that he's that he's like neutered uh, or... Okay. So it's like a vet tattoo. And he also has a clipped ear, which is another sign for feral cats like that, you know, that they're neutered. Got it. Um, Got it. So yeah, but we, we think that he was probably like a deli cat or a bodega cat or maybe somebody was taking care of do him. Have, somebody was feeding him. Do they him. have bodegas in Philly? I imagine they have to. I feel like New York is the only place that has bodegas. Maybe. But he just, he's so, he's so like friendly with people and so social. Um, I'm excited to meet Benny. But yeah, he's cool. He is like, he, you know, like he's maybe a bit of, I don't, he's not necessarily a troublemaker, but he's got a ton of energy. And so like occasionally he'll like cuddle up on me on the couch, but then all of a sudden like grab like, that he's he you know he's like being playful right, right, right. and I'm like oh god <laughs> he's a, he's a sneak attacker but maybe, maybe I'll have to find some cat toys for Benny see yeah if he, see if he likes him but anyway so that's the that's that's the roundup of James's you had, weekly a, you had a big week I have yeah. had nothing this week <laughs> I'm getting the studio together it's coming along good it's a big deal um so hopefully we'll we'll get a podcast in there soon uh, but yeah that's all I got oh buy a pin buy a pin. We have a pin right here. We have one if right here. If you're watching the video, the minor details asterisk pin. You know, it's a great way to support the podcast. If you'd enjoyed it, if we've ever given you any little bit of value. Yeah. You know. How, how much is a pin, Oh, uh, I don't know. $12? $12. Plus shipping, but I think it's not. I think if you ship it internationally, that's when it gets expensive. So I apologize for my international. For the price but. of a trip to Chipotle. Yes. You can support in, in, in New our York, podcast. At, at, everywhere else, Chipotle is way cheaper. Is it? Yeah. Why do we live here? Everything's so expensive. Here. <laughs> For the price of a burrito, in of New a York. burrito, and maybe a beer at another Chipotle in America, <laughs> you can support this podcast. Um, but yeah, we do really appreciate everyone that has purchased a pin already. So yeah, thank uh, you. If you and you know, show it off. Put a little story up there. Put your pin on your shirt. Show it off. Yeah. We'll, we'll repost it. Hopefully. Show it off to your friends. Tell them what it's all about. Right. Share the good word about the Minor Details podcast. That's right. That's right. Um, Design news. The Democratic first debate was last night, and what a show. Oh, man. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so I was... I was on Instagram today. This is this is original minor details. This design is news. original we reporting. Like to, it, this this is like a fun thing. If we find design news that no one else has found, we're excited. About yeah, it. we've got our ear to the ground. We're on the beat. Uh, so anyway, um, I was on Instagram and I happened to be as I normally am searching Karim Rashid's name. Right, you're a, a Karim fan. Yeah, and the weirdest thing has happened today uh at least that i can tell that it started today is that when you search him his name doesn't pop up now this is strange for maybe two reasons one of which is like he's probably the most popular most followed kareem rashid yeah there's not any other kareem on Rashids. instagram i mean there's, on there's definitely other people named kareem rashid but obviously he's the only one that's yeah. famous so if you look up his name... But this isn't just his name. This isn't his handle because his Instagram handle is Kareem underscore Rashid underscore official. Yes, but you should just be able to type in Karim Rashid. Right, because you could type in Jasper Morrison yeah. and it pops up which or I, any other... Which I found design. out I wasn't even following Jasper Morrison. I mean, you even just typed in Jasper and he popped up. Yeah, so this that's strange that somebody that I would be... Like and and the other strange part is that somebody that I would be following right would should just pop up like if you, I typed you're, in K A R right you are a big fan of Krim so like the algorithm should know yes right and so this is just very odd okay and and I went to the Discord to ask people I asked you first right to 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 search 
and it happens to me too and i'm not as big as a follow i don't even follow cream machine yeah so so you looked him you looked him up it didn't come up it didn't come up unless you put in his like actual handle, handle name right and so you gotta do official it's cream oh, machine official. Under, underscore official um so yeah now it pops up but for everybody else in the discord that did this the same thing happened except for somebody outside of the u.s and canada oh i didn't know that interesting which makes it much more interesting hmm. um so the question is why like is this just a glitch or is this something else it's the algorithm man i don't know what to i tell don't you. i don't think so nick because the other part of this is, is that the other day... You do have a I, theory. And I've seen Karam post these kind of images before. Right. But he did post, um, I guess what you would call a half-naked woman. <laughs> with, On his Instagram story. Yes. And, with, and Karam has, what, 80,000 followers? How many followers? Oh, more, th more than that. He's got 116. 116 followers? Yeah. So... Uh, and but she was she was covering her chest with her arm. Right, and this is assumed to be someone who had sent Karim a nude photo. Maybe we, we, we don't really know. Actually. We don't know. This is we don't know. We this is a this is a hypothesis. Re regardless, Karim posted this on his story. My my hypothesis is that from that story, somebody reported Karim, and or there were multiple complaints. Yeah, so, I, I think you would have to get multiple reports for this to happen, for sure. Yeah, so and so they they made it so that he was harder to search. That's interesting, though. That's my theory. I don't have any any necessary basis for that, right? But I, it does seem somewhat coincidental. Yeah, uh, Karim was also very open about the whole like sexuality of designs, yes. that kind of stuff. So yeah. he's always talking about those, you know, very. Uh, Risque topics. Yes, and uh, if there's anything you know that we know about America, America gets squeamish when when sex is. That's interesting because you're right. In Europe, there's a lot looser laws around that. Yeah, especially like when you talk about like commercials and stuff. Yeah, so it's interesting. I don't know if that's the reason why, but it's a very strange thing that it would only be happening to Karim Rashid. Well, there's also this tangent. So, so we started okay. this tangent on the Discord, but. Uh, have you ever had this experience where you're on Instagram and you close out the app and then up in the left-hand corner, you still see that like red recording symbol? No. So I've had this experience a couple times and then I posted it in the, in the Discord. Join the Discord, guys. It's oh, where everything's going down. Oh, you posted it in the Discord? Uh, no, I, I haven't posted a photo of it. I have oh, to, okay. I have to f eventually find a, a f image of it. But, uh, you know, essentially what is happening is like when you close out the app, your iPhone is like, hey you're recording and then it stops yeah like it's a split second of like uh that notification in the top corner saying that you're recording like mm. if you, like if you open up your uh recording app on your phone on your mm -hmm. iphone and you press record and you close it there'll be like a little red symbol in the top left yeah it just means your microphone's on huh. and so i've had this a couple times it doesn't happen all the time but it, it happens a couple times on instagram where you close it out and the it says the microphone's on Weird. Which makes me think that they're listening. They, and now, and then this is a whole other rabbit. Yeah, but. It, yeah. We, you know, we. There was talk in the Discord, and and Allison and I talk about this all the time. That we'll be having a conversation right. about a certain topic. You open up your phone, and you get an ad, and you get an ad. Um, also, in Instagram news, uh, because I watch uh, <laughs> CBS this morning every morning. Because yeah, you got cable. Because I I am uh, fifty five years old. Yes, <laughs> I'm a, I'm in my golden years. Wait, do you really have cable? That's right, because you watch. HGTV. No, no, no. We we just uh, we use my parents' password. Okay, I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. But uh, so so yeah, we watched CBS this morning. Gail King was interviewing the head of Instagram, and they they are talking seriously about eliminating likes from Instagram. Yeah, well, there was a, a test done in canada that they, yeah I, I think the one the test that i saw was it, it eliminated the number of likes yeah you can still like the photo yes and you as the owner of the photo can view how many likes you got right. but your followers cannot see how many likes your photos got yeah so um yeah because i saw i think dom right uh posted what it looked like canadian boys and so it's like it's liked by 
this person and others or right. something like that. Um, I, you know, how do you feel about that? It's fine. I, I think it's fine. I, I don't. I would re- say I'm indifferent. Yeah, I don't really have a strong stance about it. They did interview a bunch of teens and they were like kind of split on it. But like this one, this one teenager was like, if I don't get 200 likes, I think, I think this is a direct quote. If I don't get 200 likes on a photo, I delete it. I mean, I've never deleted anything that didn't get like because of the likes or anything. Yeah. The only photo I've ever deleted was like promotional photo. Hmm. Like, like something that someone wanted me to post. Yeah. Uh, like, I think like, I can't remember, but... Um, yeah, I deleted that nude that I sent to Kar- Karim, <laughs> but uh, that was it. Uh, but uh, it's interesting. The other thing that, they're, that they were talking about in terms of, and this is more in the weeds, but the, the whole cyberbullying thing is like Instagram can detect like a negative comment uh. at like when you when you press send and they'll ask you are you sure you want to send this oh that's interesting it's huh that's very fascinating yeah that's gonna get into some more <laughs> sticky situations yeah. for sure come at me trolls <laughs> well i mean i mean just just like when you start censoring people's comments is gonna well they're not censoring all they're doing is saying hey you sure about that right but you know, first that's the first step. Maybe I don't know. Maybe we'll see. That's a. It's that's another topic. Instagram has 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 you know not been the wild west for a while. Like they're you know they're definitely doing some stuff behind the scenes. Yeah. I feel like, but anyway, that was the original design news. Original design news with a lot of Instagram tangents. Yes, on it. Uh, but uh, yeah, our t- our topic this week we were thinking about it. And we are thinking about how a lot of people praise creativity as like mm. a, a really, like I guess maybe the pinnacle of, of a good designer is someone who's creative, right? Uh, but uh, and I've heard this before, um, but and I'm sure that it's a, a common a common thread. But you know, is worth ethic, you know, hard work and willingness to learn greater than creativity? Mm. This, I mean. When I initially hear that statement, I think, of course, but I think it also gets at this idea of, can anybody be creative? Can anybody, like, can anybody with enough hard work, like, work ethic, can they be as creative as, you know, the most creative person? I mean, I guess this could even get down into, like, uh, just like, are you born with these skill sets? Because I think mm. some of these do lend themselves to like just personality traits. Right. I know like not everyone has the strongest worth ethic and can you actually improve your worth eth- ethic? You or is keep, that something you you're keep... born with or raised with or what? <laughs> you keep, is I don't know if it's the sickness, but you keep saying worth ethic. Work, work. Did I say worth ethic? Worth ethic. Worth ethic. Did I say that? <laughs> oh, shoot. Work, we'll have to work ble- ethic. We'll have to bleep it out. Work ethic? <laughs> I still have a little bit of a stuffy nose from it's, from last week's hey, podcast. It's but. okay, um, but sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> well, no, I was just I was talking about like the idea that you know not everyone has the strongest worth ethic. Everyone has a variation you of worth ethic. <laughs> worth ethic. <laughs> Work ethic. You have the worth amount of worth ethic. <gasps> oh man, this podcast! I swear. <laughs> All right, not everyone can h- work hard. Should I, should I say work hard? Work hard, yeah. Uh, is this is that something that you can learn? Like, can you train yourself to work harder? Can you train yourself to have a stronger? Like, maybe this even goes even farther. Like, I think that passion is something that a lot of people are born with. Like, you have mm. passion for something, and it's hard to like train yourself to be passionate about something. Well, that's the question. But can you? Is well, is the is the thing about it? Is it passion or is it is it that you are risk adverse i mean there are definitely people who are who are more or less risk adverse and you find that with a lot of entrepreneurs is that they are not as risk adverse as other people right you know they're not afraid of failure and i think you can you can train people to to be like 
uh, have a better work ethic, ha- be less risk adverse. But I think it takes a lot of time if it's not something that is already like baked into you basically mm. yeah i can see that like it would it, you can definitely train yourself to be more risky but it's definitely going against your grain yes but over time if it, if you practice it long enough i'm sure that you could yeah i i don't know because you know so so for me like thinking about about myself like i would say that i am slightly risk adverse to the point where like I try to get into sort of an entrepreneurial mindset and I start to second guess almost everything. And I feel like a lot of that is just I, I'm not able to go over that those initial hurdles mm. once I start second guessing myself. The second guessing thing is a hard thing. A lot of times what I'll do if I have the momentum is just work or or just like push push through things because like, I'm just in that state of mind to do that. Like I, I'm in the state of mind to push past those mental blockades. Right. But that's not my normal self. Right. It's just like you have your foot on the gas and it's like, okay, I'm just can I keep it on there and yeah. push past? But I, you know what's interesting? Because I actually think you are more risky than me in your designs. Hmm. I think your aesthetic sensibility is a little more risky. Hmm. Uh, but I do kind of see what you're saying where I feel like Maybe on the contrary, where I'm less risky with my designs, I'm more risky in like the execution. Mm. Like I'm, I'm more trigger happy. I'll fire something off <laughs> without without second guessing. Right. Right. Yes, I would. I would agree with that. I think that like when things are are more in that concept realm where nothing has been tr- truly solidified. Right. I will. You'll go I will out be there. very out there, yeah. risky, and with I'm like, types what? Of oh my gosh, James, this is a crazy <laughs> idea! But yeah, I, I, I know that that's an aspect of myself when it comes to like the execution of sort of the the final stages of the project is when I start second guessing everything, and I, I do need to get, I do need to get myself in more of a habit of, of just like doing what you do and just sort of like make things break things yeah just do it uh and you know that is that is one way like i think that if you're in school with with people that you admire for their certain qualities spending time with them and working alongside them or like at least observing their behaviors Mm. can help you to figure out like how to overcome the issues that you're having maybe that is with, within your own work. Yeah, that's a really good tip. Because like w- what you're saying, like if you feel that your hardworkingness is not as uh, maybe you don't have that natural trait, I think for sure if you start hanging out with people that work really hard, yeah, you will definitely work harder. Oh yeah, and I I, I love that about school. That was like a, the best right. part about school. I'm infinitely grateful for the the class of designers that I went to school with. Yeah, because I just had people like like Reed Schlegel um, and, and Oscar Salguero and Chris Carpenter and like all these people that like really pushed me in different ways. And, you know, we were always the people that were hanging out in the studio. Yeah. And, you know, uh, like, and I think that that, that was really good for all of us. Cause I think we all like filled gaps of the other person. Right. Yeah. One thing that you mentioned at the beginning was, the creativity aspect of is is everyone creative? Yeah. Or like can everyone be creative? Well that's that's the thing is like you know, so there I do think that there is this thing and and they talk about this with personality traits is like the openness to ideas. And some people just aren't as open to new ideas as other people. Yeah. Like you can certainly see that with artists um when they adopt new technologies to do their art or they um, address subject matter that's maybe controversial or whatever. Right. It's like they, that's that's like a risk adverse thing, but it's also just like an openness to ideas and openness to exploring different types of ideas and not feeling like, you know, because you, you've been in those group situations, those where you're working with people and somebody is just always like, no, that's yeah. Mm, that's not going to work. Right. Uh-uh. No. For and, sure. And it's like you have to train that person to be like 
like that's why they are they're always saying like there's no bad ideas in a brainstorm it's right. like because of that one person right like that person who's just going to shoot out down every idea because the way their mind works is they're just so pragmatic yeah. about everything and you know the the whole idea of like being open with your ideas and coming up with crazy ideas is like yeah maybe that particular concept that you sketch up is a crazy concept like you know a flying toaster or whatever yeah but the part about it is like that might spur on someone else's idea right to come up with like oh maybe it's not flying toast maybe it's just flying toast yeah right yeah and i think you know there's this other part of creativity and being a creative person where creativity as a concept has all of this stuff packed into it and i feel like you know maybe this is a tangent but the other the other side to you like being a creative person is is sometimes you are extremely hard on yourself when you feel like you're not being as creative as you're able to be and I think that can discourage actually a lot of creative people. Like they'll they can have really great ideas. Right. But like if you're if you're not practicing being creative and and doing the work like an industrial designer going in every day and really like flexing that creative muscle and you just have like a cool idea every once in a while like it's just um oh man it's I, I'm trying to remember where where I was headed. Do you I mean, I kind of think I, I, what you're saying to me is like, you know, as a as a person in, that works in the creative industry, you're kind of expected to go in every day and come up with creative ideas. Yeah. But there are some days where it's like these ideas are not working. Mm. And that can be really hard because you're going to – it kind of feels like – I remember – so there was this one time uh, I was working at Petmate and uh, we had our intern – there john and john was just sitting at his desk just just thinking like not doing not doing anything uh, just sitting at his desk and uh one of the like marketing people or more analytical people walked by and was like john what are you doing get to work right <laughs> and because everyone else in the office that is not creative actually there's like a physical task that they're doing whether right. that's typing or emailing or doing excel spreadsheets right yeah and john was like no i'm i'm i am i am working i'm just thinking yeah and which was funny, and uh, this person brought it up in the meeting in front of everyone once. And, of course, like, the design team and everyone, you know, like, my, my VP of design was like, oh, yeah, like, that's totally fine. Like, yeah. w- you know, he, we were all on board. Right. But it was just, like, kind of shocking to the other people in the room that were like, oh, but we actually have to do work at reset. Right. We right. don't have time to, like, sit down and think about stuff. <laughs> it's it's part of the reason why I think that sketching is, is so... Um is so highlighted within our industry is is maybe because it's like you, a physical way of thinking. You, yeah, it's a physical way and 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 it looks like you're working. Right, right. You know, whereas you I mean, you could maybe do the same amount of work all in your mind. Right. Like, you know, especially especially as you gain experience as a designer, you can sort of start to iterate in your mind more than I I would say that I could back when I was in school. But, uh, but yeah, that is funny that like, you know, it's some, it's a detail that's in like, uh, the show Mad Men, um, Don Draper, who's like, you know, he, he's working in advertising and putting together these campaigns and he's just always like laying on his couch with like a, like whiskey and, or just like (laughs) taking naps, staring out the window. Yeah. But it, it is one creativity is sort of this like very amorphous thing. Right. Um, and I do feel that there are creative people out there who run into one roadblock and, and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that creative. I think being a creative person also comes along with a lot of self doubt. I think there's also this stigma around creativity where it's like, oh, people who are creative come up with these wacky, crazy ideas. Right. And that's not necessarily always true. Like being a designer, you like a creative idea as a designer might just be like a new way of of a new functionality of something, right. like thinking just slightly different around. Things. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I feel like there's another part of it, which is that designers often feel like 
they get labeled as the creatives. Right. Whereas, you know, I've worked with a lot of engineers that are just as creative, just right. in a completely different right. way. And it's like a problem solving type of way. Yeah. Right. And so they're just like, they're looking at these like really, you know, tiny mechanisms or whatever right. and figuring out new ways to reconfigure to make things work. And that's like a type of creativity that I'm not capable of tapping into. I don't know if I could if I went to engineering school, but I don't think I would want to. Yeah. It's just a t it's just an aspect of creativity that doesn't satisfy my craving, I guess. Right. But I guess I, I kind of want to bring it back to the original yeah. topic, which was, <laughs> which was, is work ethic greater than creativity? I think that in the long run, you you need to like, you need to be able to work consistently and output consistently in order to be successful as a creative person. I, I, I would agree. I, I do think that work ethic is greater than, I'm trying to be really particular with it. <laughs> work ethic is very, is, is greater than creativity only because I think that creativity is kind of a, like if you practice it, it's almost like a, uh, effect of work ethic mm -hmm. like what you're saying like if you execute over and over again on your ideas that may or may not be creative at one point you will have a creative idea mm -hmm. that you have actually executed yeah because there are way too many people out there that have ideas and right. there are not as many people that i can actually execute on them yes yeah i think um i, I mean on the one hand that we do know of just astounding creative people and is that just is that just a matter of they are working harder producing more like producing you know no know, or knowing how to get their work out in front of people right. or are they just exceptionally creative people and maybe um, and maybe there's two paths there like or there, i'm sure there's more than two but like maybe you're right like there is this path of like if you produce work and you just keep doing that over and over again, you're going to hit something eventually that's yeah. going to be good. Whereas maybe there is that person that is less less hardworking and doesn't produce as much, mm -hmm. but maybe they're more creative so that when they do produce something, it mm. does come out fully fleshed out. Interesting. That's interesting. So maybe there are kind of two pathways there. Yeah, that that's I cool. See. I like that idea. I mean, I think about a lot of like famous artists Yeah, where, you know, like Pablo Picasso just has a ton of work yeah and you know not all of it's great but the stuff he did hit on was great yeah yeah well i maybe it's the difference of the the designer sitting at their desk thinking and you know like and you know, so, machine so just going yeah at it. yeah so there's so there's maybe there's maybe these two types of designers or i mean maybe there's more than that but there's the person who is eliminating all of the the ideas before getting to the final idea that you know eliminating the ideas that have no legs right and then there's just the the designer who's constantly creating right and so like i think of it as <laughs> like it's the difference between like radiohead and um the clash so like the clash like their albums were like 24 songs long right and like maybe maybe like you know half of those or a third of those are just like whoo, amazing i mean the the clash's albums are great but but that sort of like punk band ethos is like short songs lots of songs right whereas like a band like radiohead comes around with like a 10 song album every five or six years right and it's just all amazing yeah no i can I, I definitely see those two approaches um so maybe the work is just in different there's in different places being uh executed differently yeah um but the other thing that i think of for creatives and and maybe this is just my my creative outreach right here is just like i feel like a lot of times creatives can also feel pressure to be remarkable every day right with their creativity right. And I think that that's an enormous amount of pressure to put on yourself. And so that's where like I could see creatives not doing a bunch of work because they're afraid of presenting anything that's that's like subpar. But it is just like about that like 
if you can get into that steady rhythm i yeah i just little bits per day for sure i think as a designer i think the 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 first method of just producing and getting stuff out there is better than the sitting around thinking method yeah but i'm not i don't want to dismiss both methods i think they're both different tactics yeah i personally am the guy that just shoots it off (laughs) just go (laughs) just go 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 yeah so anyway, oh, I think I think that horn is telling us to move on to the questions. <laughs> Welcome to Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, we had some questions come in this week. Actually, I think these are pretty far down in the, the email list. If you guys have questions, feel free to send them. Uh, and if we've never answered your question and you emailed it a long time ago, you probably should send it again because our, yeah. our email box is, is full. So. Or if you called oh, and yeah. we, we haven't have answered... Mail. Uh, that means that your voicemail went on too long and was cut off. Yeah, there was there was a couple of voicemails that were cut off. But uh, uh, send questions into minor details podcast at gmail dot com, and if you have a voicemail, send it to one six four six four nine four forty eleven. Um, you want to read this one, James? Yeah. Hey, fellas, you mentioned making your e folio for Behance, and I want to know the nuts and bolts of that. I have a portfolio for print and almost pulled the trigger on uploading to Behance. But what is the size you guys would recommend making your e-folio? I'm working out of the Adobe Suite InDesign, so you can use Picas or or I prefer inches. Thanks, Elliot M. Oh, man. Oh, man, James. You know this gets under oh, my skin. This is, this, is, this, is, this is why I picked this, this question, because I was like, oh. All right, Elliot. Listen, I think, and this is my opinion, I think online portfolios are the way to go in 2019. Mm. I am so sick and tired of seeing PDF portfolios everywhere, okay? I just want people to upload images of their project. No, don't you dare put any text in InDesign and, like, export PDFs, right? I just want the image that you took with your camera, Uh put it up on your Behance project. And if you have text, Behance has a way to add text to the project itself. Yeah, Nick. Yes. We are industrial designers. We create physical things. Right. How do you not appreciate the physical portfolio? Oh, no, no. I, I want to get this correct. I do appreciate the physical portfolio for okay. sure. I do not appreciate people taking their physical portfolio, exporting it as oh. a PDF, and then sending it by email or send or uploading it to Behance. Specifically uploading it to Behance. It gets yeah. on my nerves so much because... because there's always that kid that like, hey, will you check out my portfolio and sends the Behance link. And I pull it up and I pull it up on my phone, right? Because I'm on yeah. Instagram and they're sending me a message on Instagram. And literally, it's a two-page spread shrinked down to the size of the yeah, width of my that's, phone. that's pretty bad. And it's full of multiple images and blocks of text. That's and I'm like, bad. I am... First of all, I'd have to get get out my microscope, let alone my bifocals, <laughs> and like zoom in to my screen to be able to see this. Yeah. It's, sorry. That's tough. Sorry, Elliot. I just, I, I, this question came in and I was like, we got to make this right. Yeah. And I, I know I've ranted on about this multiple times, but you know, it's, it's always a good reminder. Yes. I think that's my opinion. Do you, do you know the size for Behance, like the aspect ratio? Uh, I mean, you need to experience, like you need to think about the experience of Behance. So it's a scrolling, uh, page, right? Like mm-hmm. as, as most, uh, websites are, you scroll down. So I think that having some sort of, you know, portfolio where as you scroll, you see the story is the best best method. Well, there's no you, necessarily size. There is a size, though. There's definitely a, a viewing size because like if you are because I don't know, are you are you, when you're making your portfolio, are you just making one long scroll for no. the page? No, you are just taking your images and you, putting them into Behance. Yeah. Uploading to Behance. So there are there are some images that are too tall to yes. be viewed it, in you, the entire page. I would say, you know, the the one thing I like to do is for Behance or scrolling things, I like to put sketch pages as portfolio or a portrait mode. So when you scroll through, it's like you start off with the thumbnails, you see a bunch of thumbnails, and as you scroll, you get to larger and larger sketches. Mm-hmm. Um, in contrast to that, if I'm making a printed book, I do that in landscape. So you start reading from the left, you see all these little thumbnails, and then as you go to the right, you see your larger and larger sketches. Yeah. You got to look Nicholas Baker's. Oh, my God. But um, in terms of the actual final project, I think... Uh, 
you're probably better off with a square format or a landscape format just so it does fit on your screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of up to you. Yeah. But there's definitely, like, so this this size here, right. you don't have a specific size for that to, to be able to fit the entire... No. There's, there's Cause definitely... Because that, this is, that, that's a portrait, but it, you scroll through it. Yeah. But you don't, you wouldn't want this to be... Yeah. Like that. You wouldn't want it to be cropped out I, of I, I, the scroll. Exactly. I think just generally, you just need to think about how people are going to view your portfolio. Mm-hmm. Think about if you were an employer and you're going to open up your phone and look at this uploaded PDF on yeah. Behance, you're going to throw your phone away. I almost threw my phone away. <laughs> <laughs> so just, yeah, just think about phone. the experience of viewing your portfolio. I think as a designer, we need to think about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to go off my he rant. Gets all, he gets all heated I get, up. I get all heated about the portfolio thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Nick. Are you going to uh, to read War and Peace here? Yeah, I'll read the uh, next question, which is uh, quite a long question, but I think it's a good question. Mm-hmm. Uh, this comes from Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, Nick, James, my question is, as designers, it seems we have that default rut that we get sucked into. And I know that the biggest hang-up that comes to mind is that we don't have that proven guarantee that will end up successful. Mm-hmm. And there's this issue of expectation as well. If you walk into a presentation without having a whiz-bang rendering or some good production drawings, we may not even get a second glance. You know, for, for example, like if you chose to model your entire product cycle out of Play-Doh, chances are your client will not be impressed Uh and, and you have no guarantee that you'll be able to get the results you want either way. So if you give yourself a chance to try and fail a few times in a completely different design process, in a situation that isn't high stakes, you may be able to develop a new process. What are side projects for? Am I right? So would a different design process in, so what would a different design process entail for you guys? Uh, thanks for the pod and the insights, guys. Jeremiah. This is quite a little lengthy question, a little bit. Uh, I appreciate your question, Jeremiah. I'll try to distill it to some degree. I think kind of what Jeremiah is saying is like, you know, we, we get into this this idea of kind of this the same monotonous process of design. And that might be true for some people for sure. Uh, and there's always ways to mix up your design process. But, you know, how do you change your design process without affecting the actual design? Mm-hmm. If you want to experiment with a new method, and you don't want your client to like be like, "Uh oh, what are you doing? This is not how I envisioned this." Because mm. your design process can affect kind of the client's perception of the design, right? As we know, yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to think of the, like a case where I like change the design process because I'm so used to like with my clients working with people who are very familiar with the design process, right. but also familiar with creatives, and so likely to be okay if I were to do something different right. from the normal process. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I, I've had a few similar scenarios to this where, I mean, I, I talked about one scenario, I'm sure I've talked about a couple times on the podcast where it was like one of my very first projects and coming out of school, I was like, oh, well, here is the, actually, I was still in school. I was like, oh, yeah, here's the process we learned. First you research, then you sketch, then yeah. you, do, you know, just the regular school process. And so the first thing I showed them was just a bunch of research. And they were like, excuse me, I know what the research is. I, <laughs> I just showed them market research of right. like similar products. And like, they were like, yeah, I run a company about this product. I know all of this research. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So I think like you definitely need to, you know, understand what your client's expectations are. But in terms of like trying new things, I think you definitely need to try that on your own first. Right. Like whether that's a side project or maybe just, you know, I I don't know. Yeah. Well, this is interesting because this came up on the Discord is I I posted um, Scott Henderson's work. And this is this is not to call you out, Connor, but uh, Connor uh, Mickelveen, he was saying he was looking at Scott's website and saying, like, there's no process on here. Right. Like, wh- why? Why doesn't he have this process? And, and this Don't is sim- need- this is similar to a lot of well-known designers. Like yeah. Not to Fukusawa, Nendo, Jasper, Jasper Morrison. And 
I mean, I think that at a certain point in your career, if you've established a strong portfolio, I think perhaps your clients, if you have good clients, like I think that they would be willing to grant you the flexibility to do things that are outside of what a normal design process would look like because they are confident right. in your success. I think the reason the process is so important in in the beginning is because you're establishing a reputation. And so you want your reputation to be, I'm a thoughtful designer. Right. I work hard. I'm I am thinking about everything and here I I will present you with all of this material. Right. But when you're at a Jasper Morrison level, like you can just be like, and here it is. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I think that to some degree, you know, e- even those big famous designers do present certainly choices, certainly options to the clients. Maybe. I know that I, I always reference him, but I know that Paul Rand presented one concept always. He his whole thing. You can watch the interview that they do with Steve Jobs about him designing the uh, next logo, right? And he's like, and, and he's talking about Paul Rand, and he said, Paul s- came to me and said, "I will solve your problem for you," like you know, because he was like, "Oh, you can come back, give me a couple options." Right. Paul Rand said, "I will, I will solve your problem for you, and you will pay me." Right. And that is that, it, like. You know, and that's, I mean, that I don't know how many designers that can, takes a lot of guts can get away that. with that. But I mean, that's, you know, that is how I feel at certain times with with work is like, I know I can see the solution. Well, this happened just today, too. Mm-hmm. We had an incident today where we were working on a project where, well, you know, it kind of came down to like, there is one correct composition for this design. Yeah. And this is it. Yeah. Even though like it kind of went out against some of the other against maybe what the client wanted it was like i know that this is maybe not what you want but this is the correct design right and you know but at the same time like you in in dealing with clients you you do have to give your explanation you do have to give your reasoning right like but i think that what a lot of the really great designers do is they build really tight well-formulated narratives around like why this design makes sense right and and in a way that makes it compelling to like they're selling it they're they are really selling it to the client and uh you know so i think that for them it's not necessarily about executing the same process maybe over and over i and uh, well, of course every designer is different i mean to that degree you don't even you can do whatever you want right I mean, if you want to switch up your process that's fine because the client's never going to see that they, yeah they're just going to see the end result yeah which which actually makes me think of another kind of maybe avenue to answer this question is like if you want to try a new process or try presenting a different way to a client maybe you present your traditional way you know, the way that's been proven out, like maybe it's renderings or whatever it is. Yeah. And then you also add on, tack on a little extra credit. Mm. Be like, oh yeah, I was playing around with this other way of, of trying something out. I don't know if you want to see it. Um, and then you present your new method. I actually did this a little bit when I was doing, I've tried a little bit of presenting in, in VR. Yeah. Like, well, not like physically in VR, but like, I'll sketch in VR, then I will upload my concepts to Sketchfab, which is like an online 3D viewer. Yeah. And I'll kind of, I'll, I'll email the link to my client and be like, Hey, take a look at these sketches. Yeah. And you can view them from all different angles and see different like features of them. Right. Which is definitely a different way of presenting. And, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily good or bad. I, I definitely think that, I've found the most success with just presenting very, you know, nice renderings. I think kind of like what Jeremiah was saying is like when you present really nice renderings, your client's excited about it and they really can see the concept. Yeah. Yeah. I think renderings do get most clients pretty excited because it just, I mean, it's, you know, the feeling that you have when you drop 
CAD into Keyshot right. and started applying materials. We get excited about yeah, it. Yeah, we get excited. So of course the clients are going to get excited. I think it is just about gauging your client. It, it definitely like, is client dependent. Is your, is your client somebody who's like open to this kind of stuff and gets excited about it? Like they're excited about the process or right. are they just looking for results? Yeah. So anyway. Uh, yeah, thanks for sending that in, Jeremiah. Hopefully that helped helped your long question but um yeah uh shout out of the week oh yeah so uh i found this guy and his instagram handle is unnecessary inventions all right well let's see and uh i i forget his, his full name but um what he does is he i believe he's, he's doing it quite frequently like every other day he comes up with these crazy ideas 3d prints them out and then just like posts them. and so right now we're looking at a cup holder that slides over your shirt pocket, <laughs> which is actually kind of useful. Like, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm not necessarily design related, but like just kind of fun in a way. I mean, I guess it's kind of design related. Yeah. Not, not traditional industrial design related. Uh, but... This is built in. This is, this is, oh, this it's is built into the shirt. Tailored it's, to the shirt. It's sewn onto the shirt. Yes. That's crazy. Uh, and you got the, uh, this is a necklace with ice cubes on it. But so like, you know, he has an iced out necklace, as rappers would say. He does. He does a great job of of filming these. And like the art direction is really great. I believe he has a YouTube channel, which I haven't looked into extensively. But uh, but yeah, (laughs) this is great. What is this? So this is this is uh, to avoid opening bathroom doors. Oh, okay. So this is like a second like Lego hand strapped onto your arm so that you don't have to touch the handle. Yes, it's perfect. Yeah. I, w- I want an extension to be able to like flush the toilet yeah. without having to touch it. You should send him a message. Oh, the double-sided sports bottle. I mean, these are just like <laughs> amazing. It's, and it's a lot of fun, funny stuff. And I think it's just, it's kind of like what we were ta- talking about with the creativity topic. Yeah. It's like these ideas are, you know, arguably kind of crazy, kind of dumb. Right. But they can really inspire someone to come out and create something that's actually useful or unique. Yeah. Uh, and this also reminds me of the the idea of a chindogu, which is I believe a Japanese uh, thing where yeah you know it's essentially an unnecessary invention, an invention that doesn't really help you and it almost hinders you. But um, you can look up Chindogu and see a bunch of the, this whole kind of concept. And there's also a 99% Invisible podcast about this. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I I feel like unnecessary invention inventions is taking some inspiration because right here we see the butter stick. Yes, and it's uh, like a, it's like a. Well, this actually looks pretty useful. Yeah, uh, I would use that. This is like a glue stick, but instead of glue, it's butter. But unnecessary inventions. They made the avocado. Oh my gosh, the millennial version. The avocado stick. So you kind can just of like a deodorant. S- spread avocado onto your toast. Yes, that's crazy. So, yeah, so that's uh that's pretty cool i i love yeah i love the art direction it's very vibrant check him out very what, colorful what's his, name? what's his name again his name is uh maddie benedetto yeah doing some crazy fun stuff it just like brings a little smile to your day yeah absolutely um but yeah uh buy a pin guys buy a pin um subscribe like all the good stuff. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Of course, our amazing uh, intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, as always, I'm at, at Nick P. Baker. I'm at I Draw on Receipts. Peace out. Later. You know, is worth ethic? Strongest worth ethic. Prove your worth ethic. It's worth ethic. Strongest worth ethic. Worth ethic. Worth ethic. Worth ethic.